Good evening. I'm Ping Liang, a proud member of the World Affairs Council and past board president. Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm very excited about tonight's distinguished guest, Ambassador Johnny Carson, and his presentation. This will be a very informative discussion on Africa and US policy toward Africa. Before we begin, as you know, I need to take care of some World Affairs Council business. As most of you are current members of the World Affairs Council through a general, corporate, or educational membership, we want to thank you for your support of our programs. We also encourage you to share information about our council with your family and friends. They can also sign up for a free email membership through our website. That way, they will also receive updates about the Council's great program offerings. For those of you who want to have further information on the topics we are covering during this eight weeks, great decision textbooks are available for purchase in the lobby for only $20, which is 10% savings. So this is the book uh, as some of you already have. Uh, if you're interested, you can uh, see outside after the program. We want to thank our Great Decision Series media sponsor, WGVU, and tonight, Davenport University, Gerald Niem Bane. I believe you're here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, you are on our Great Decision Committee, and we thank you for helping to sponsor this wonderful program. So as you all know, it's through our sponsors that we are able to bring you all these wonderful programs. So please, again, join me thanking WGVU and also Davenport University in support of our council. As you may have heard in previous programs, Kathy Dobb, are you here? Kathy, please raise your hand. Oh, here she is. Um, this group is called Expats and Cultural Explorers Meetup Group. They meet after our great decision programs at local bars or restaurants for further informal discussions. Tonight, they are meeting immediately after the program at Derby Station on Wealthy Street in East Grand Rapids. Now, let's turn to tonight's program. We're very honored to have Ambassador Johnny Carson with us tonight to talk about Africa transforms wealth, technology, democracy. Ambassador Carson is the former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, the National Intelligence Officer for Africa at the National Intelligence Council, and Senior Vice President of National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Ambassador's 44-year Foreign Service career includes ambassadorships to Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. He has traveled throughout Africa and is incredibly knowledgeable and experienced in global affairs, in, including Africa. Uh, actually, I should say Africa in particular. He is now teaching at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. And for our local college students, if any of you are present, I want to point out especially that Ambassador Carson, before joining the Foreign Service, was a Peace Corps volunteer. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Carson. Ping, <laughs> thank you very, very much uh, for that very kind and warm uh, introduction. Uh, I am uh, extremely uh, pleased to be here this uh, evening with all of you uh, at the World Affairs Council of Western uh, Mission, Michigan. 
Uh, I'm also uh, pleased to uh, be here uh, back in uh, the Midwest, which uh, I call home. Uh, and I'm especially pleased because uh, I have an opportunity to talk uh, with all of you about uh, Africa, uh, which has been a part of my professional uh, life uh, for much of the past uh, four decades. Africa uh, is a extraordinarily large, dynamic, and diverse continent, a continent that is often misunderstood. Africa is increasingly a good news story, but the media usually does not reflect the continent's new and changing portrait. It does not report on the enormous differences that exist from one country to another or from one region to another. Nor does it capture the current and growing significance and importance of Africa to the United States and to the international community. Africa is changing rapidly. But much of the way Americans view the continent is caught up in a mixture of old stereotypes and frightening new headlines of brutal military leaders from the past and recurring humanitarian disasters that are frequently portrayed in the news. Looking at today's papers, most Americans would point to the conflicts in Nigeria, southern Sudan, and the Central African Republic and draw an unfair conclusion about what is happening on a continent comprised of one billion people living in 54 separate countries and occupying a land mass that is three times the size of the United States. Let me share with you some of my observations about a continent that I have had the privilege of studying, watching, and working on for many, many years. While conflict, poverty, and disease continue to challenge various parts of this large area, this is not the whole story, and it should not be portrayed as the dominant one. Africa is a dynamic and exciting place, and the continent's trend lines are increasingly positive, not negative. Support for democracy in Africa remains strong and has continued to grow. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union in December of 1991, Sub-Saharan Africa has moved progressively into the democratic column, and multi-party democracy is the preferred form of governance all across Sub-Saharan Africa. Reliable and widespread polling data show that well over 75% of Africans support elected democratic governments. This can be seen by a number of studies. In 1973, Freedom House, one of America's leading international political advocacy groups, developed a matrix to measure whether a state was free, partially free, or not free at all. The designation free meant democratic. 
in the first year that that matrix was published back in 1973, only three, only three African states were defined as free, and only nine others were defined as partially free. The others were considered authoritarian dictatorships, some under military rule. Today, that picture has changed dramatically. In 2013, Freedom House assessed that nine African states were free and that another 21 were partially free. And as the numbers reflect, numerous African countries have adopted new constitutions, embraced multi-party democracy, established functioning parliaments and independent judiciaries, and in some states, impose term limits on their top political leaders. Elections, many of them monitored and observed by such organizations as the Carter Center, the National Democratic Institute, and the International Republican Institute are commonplace across the continent. In just the past six months, probably something that did not catch the attention of anyone, probably in this room, but we have witnessed successful multi-party democratic elections in Mozambique, in Malawi, Zambia, and Namibia. And the outgoing president of Namibia, having served two terms, was recently given a $5 million dollar award as being one of the best leaders in Africa. This is in Namibia. In Mozambique and Namibia, the two former presidents were operating under constitutional term limits, and they stepped down after serving their required terms. And in Malawi, a sitting former president was defeated and stepped aside peacefully. No military interventions, no police on the street. And certainly over the past six years, we have seen similar peaceful democratic transitions play out across the continent. In West Africa, in Senegal, where opposition leader Macky Sall replaced President Abdullah Wad and in Ghana, where Vice President John Mahama replaced the late John Atta Mills. And we have seen countries that have strayed from the democratic path, like those in Mali and Madagascar, revise their constitutions, hold new elections, and select new leaders. Women have also benefited from Africa's growing democratization. In Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is currently in the middle of her second term as president of that country. And in South Africa and Uganda, prominent female politicians have been elected to serve as their country's parliamentary leaders. In Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the chairperson of the African Union, Africa's most important continent-wide political organization, is a woman, Dr. Dulmini Zuma. The African Union has also embraced the continent's march towards greater democratization. It has now imposed a rigid rule that no president or prime minister or government representative can take his or her seat in the organization's deliberations if they have come to power as a result of a military coup d'etat or an extra legal or unconstitutional change of government. The AU, the African Union, has also put in place a peer review mechanism that allows citizens to assess the quality and performance 
of their governments. If asked, virtually every African head of state, even those who were doing wrong, would say he or she is in office under a democratic mandate. But despite the political progress that we have seen, we have to remember that in sub-Saharan Africa, there are 49 individual countries. So there will certainly be some democratic setbacks from time to time. But the trend line remains positive, and it continues to move forward on the democratic front. Economic progress in Africa and its prospects are also increasingly positive and trending up. Although Africa remains the least developed continent in the world, most of the key macroeconomic indicators and projections are relatively bright. And a growing number of business leaders look at Africa as the world's last economic frontier. Africa largely avoided the worst effects of the global economic downturn of 2008 and 2009. Over the past decade, African economies have grown by more than 5% a year, and the World Bank and the IMF are projecting that they will continue to expand by 4 or 5% over the next several years. 18 months ago, the British publication, The Economist, reported that six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. And over half of the 20 fastest growing countries are to be found on the continent. A startling revelation for many. Africa's new growth spurt is different. In the past, Africa's economic expansion has been driven almost exclusively by large reserves of oil and gas and minerals. But today's growth is being fueled by a new set of factors. Rapid urbanization and educated an expanding middle class, access and use of digital and wireless technology, economic liberalization and policy reforms, easier access to credit, and greater domestic investment on capital projects. Let me just talk for a moment about one of those issues. The introduction of mobile technology has had a near revolutionary impact on almost every aspect of African life. Over 350 million people across Africa, more than the entire population of the United States, use cell phones. And the mobile phone market is growing by over 40% a year, the fastest in the world. Mobile technology has reduced business costs, created jobs, improved health outcomes, and aided farmers to get better prices for their crops. In East Africa, Kenyan entrepreneurs and the nation's largest cell phone company have developed a mobile banking system called M-Pesa, which allows millions of Kenyans who have never walked into a bank or a financial institution before to move money across the country, to send money to their families uh, and uh, their
children and to undertake commercial transactions. Today, there is more mobile banking per capita across Africa than there is in the United States. In Kenya, Ghana, and Senegal, young African entrepreneurs are sitting in front of computers, developing new programs and creating new apps that are appropriate not only for their countries, but for developing and developed countries as well. Kenya is one country that is leading the way, encouraging the growth of digital technology centers and rebranding itself as the Silicon Savannah. Africa's financial markets are also starting to expand and to become more sophisticated. Although you hear little or nothing about them in the United States, Africa has 29 active stock exchanges, two of which serve as regional hubs. While some of Africa's oldest exchanges like Johannesburg, Lagos, and Nairobi have been around for a long time. Over the last 25 years, we have seen almost a doubling of the number of exchanges operating across Africa. Although relatively small in comparison to American and European markets, many of these exchanges are quite profitable. In 2013, Ghana's market went up 50%, and Kenya's climbed by 35. These gains have attracted significant outside investment, and they have spurred some exchanges to list more local companies. Just over a year ago, the board of the Nigerian Stock Exchange announced ambitious plans to encourage some 500 Nigerian countries, companies to undertake initial public offerings. Although there are these new factors that are driving and diversifying Africa's growth, recent new oil and gas discoveries along the coast of Mozambique and Tanzania, as well as offshore of Ghana and Liberia are contributing to widespread optimism about the continent's long-term economic future. The successful development of these new oil discoveries should contribute millions of dollars to the economies of these countries. In Mozambique, long regarded as one of Africa's poorest states, Natural gas discoveries could make it one of the world's largest exporters of liquefied natural gas over the next 15 to 20 years. Officials at the U.S. Geological Survey in Washington estimate that there are between 100 and 250 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in the coastal waters around the border of Mozambique and Tanzania. The successful and transparent exploitation of these new resources could transform the economies of both of these countries and dramatically improve the lives of their citizens. But to ensure its long-term economic success, Africa will have to do at least four things bring corruption under control, expand its global and regional trade, increase its manufacturing base, and improve its opportunities for girls and women. But all of this is possible as Africa continues to evolve. 
although the headlines do not reflect it, conflict and violence in Africa is actually declining. And violent conflict is down from where it was a decade ago and significantly down from where it was two decades ago. Although any violence is too much violence, we sometimes forget how many of Africa's worst conflicts have been resolved and what is being done now to mitigate those that continue. The bloody liberation conflicts that existed in Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, conflicts that dominated the headlines in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, have all been wound down. We don't see fighting in South Africa, Angola, Namibia, it's all gone. Liberia and Sierra Leone, torn apart by the brutality of Charles Taylor and made infamous by the movie Conflict Diamonds. In conflict throughout the 90s, but today Sierra Leone and Liberia have a different challenge, but it is not a challenge of war and conflict. Both of the countries have multi-party democracies. The brutal and barbaric 1998 conflict that raged for nearly two years between Ethiopia and Eritrea has ended. And in Rwanda, which we know so much about, the genocidal regime that was responsible for killing over 800,000 Tutsis has been replaced by a stable government that has generated substantial economic progress in that country. Even in Nigeria, even in Nigeria, which is facing one of Africa's most serious security challenges with Boko Haram, the level of violence has not approached the scale of the death and destruction that occurred during the Nigerian Civil War between 1967 and 70, when an estimated 5,000 people were being killed, not every year, but every week. The fact that Africa is host still to more UN peacekeepers than any other continent in the world is a reflection of the fact that it has not eliminated conflict and violence. And more needs to be done. But many of Africa's most difficult conflicts are not new. These are the ones that have been the most intractable and hard to solve. Let's think about it just for a second. The Sudan, where we have conflict in South Sudan and where we have conflict in Darfur and the North. Sudan has been in conflict with itself and intermittently with its neighbors since its independence in 1957. Somalia, famous for Black Hawk Down, October 1993. Fractured as a state in 1992 and remains divided into almost three separate political entities. And the Democratic Republic of the Congo has been politically unstable and caught up in recurring 
civil strife and conflict since its independence in 1960. We forget that that country came to independence in June of 1960, and by December of that year, already had UN peacekeepers on the ground. 1963, the only UN Secretary General ever to die in office, died trying to resolve the Congo conflict of his day. So these are not new conflicts. These are the most difficult and intractable of conflicts that remain. But let me also say that in addition to these historical hotspots, several regions in Africa are facing a new threat a new threat from radical extremism. Some of this extremism grows out of the failure of governments to deliver services. Their failure to respond effectively to perceived political and economic grievances and to their inability to provide security and stability. The addition of religious ideology and fervor add a new incendiary element to this mixture, which makes the radical extremism we are seeing today more dangerous and worrying than some of the older conflicts that I mentioned. In East Africa, Al-Shabaab continues to threaten the stability of Somalia uh, and to carry out bloody terrorist attacks against Somalis, Somalia's neighbors. In West Africa, Boko Haram has been engaged in increasingly ruthless and violent efforts to discredit and weaken the Nigerian government, and to create a caliphate in the northeastern part of the country. Boko Haram's activities have spread across the border and now threaten three of Nigeria's neighbors in Chad, in Niger, and Cameroon. And in the Sahel region of northern Mali, Al-Qaeda in the is Islamic Maghreb continues to launch attacks against the central government in Bamako and against UN troops who were stationed there. Over the next decade, Africa's historical hotspots and its new outbreaks of violent extremism will require the active attention of the United Nations the continued diplomacy of the United States and other members of the global community. But the continuation of these conflicts should not define how all of Africa's 49 sub-Saharan states are seen by the rest of the world. Just as the long-standing conflict in Yugoslavia a decade and a half ago did not define how we viewed Western or Central Europe. It is certainly time for all of us in the international community to take a more sophisticated view of Africa, its complexities, its size, its differences. As a nation, we in the United States have strong and enduring interests in Africa. Those interests are first and foremost historical. But we also have important economic, political, and security interests 
And those interests are likely to grow as Africa's importance grows. Africa, as I mentioned earlier, is considered by many as the world's last economic frontier. And the continent's population is slated to double by 2050 and to double again by the end of this century. American companies have always been major players in the oil and gas sector and in the sale of aircraft, locomotives, large generators, sophisticated medical equipment. But Africa's new economic and commercial opportunities extend beyond hydrocarbons and the sale of capital goods. And many American investors and businessmen have not been aggressive in seeking out opportunities in Africa. U.S. companies, large and small, will need to ramp up their activities in Africa if they want to grab a share of this expanding market. There is no reason why the United States, the world's largest and greatest trading country, should be left behind. China, Brazil, India, and Turkey, among others, have recognized Africa's economic potential and are moving aggressively to expand their commercial activities. Just over 18 months ago, China, for the first time, overtook the United States as Africa's largest continental-wide trading partner. China's lead will continue to grow if we do not recognize the changes that are taking place in Africa and American companies do not move more swiftly to take advantage of the new business opportunities that exist there. On the security side, we need to forge closer partnerships with Africa to address the common, and I stress common, threats that we face. Violent extremism and international terrorism, drug trafficking, money laundering, climate change, and piracy on the high seas. These are not issues to be resolved by one country, but issues that must be tackled by the global community. As one of the largest and most important voting blocks at the United Nations and one of the world's great land masses and ecosystems, Africa cannot and should not be ignored. And its positive engagement as a friend and partner can only be seen as a benefit not only to the United States, but also to the international community. And on the political side, we need to continue to work with African nations to help them to strengthen their democratic institutions, to promote good governance and the rule of law. We need to build stronger partnerships with these nations that have made democratic transitions. And we need to remain strong advocates for democracy and political reform among those countries that have not yet moved into the democratic column. Africa has made great strides in the democratic arena, but none of those things can be taken for granted. They can be reversed and rolled back. 
democracy and good governance matter, not just in the United States, but in Africa as well. Our strongest partners and allies around the world are members of the democratic family of nations. This is no accident. Democracies protect the individual civil liberties of their citizens, as well as the intellectual property and corporate rights of their companies. Democracies are accountable to their citizens and they operate under the rule of law. Supporting democracies in Africa is in our interest in both large and small ways. And this is why uh, the President Administration in Washington has made democracy its number one policy priority over the past six years. In addition to promoting democracy, the administration is focused on strengthening peace and security, expanding trade and investment, and advancing social and economic opportunity in Africa. In furthering its overall policy, the administration has launched three initiatives which are intended to deal with Africa's most serious issues in agriculture, electrical power generation, and public health. It's worth saying just a few words about those three issues. Agriculture should be one of Africa's greatest assets. The continent has 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land mass and a half a dozen of the world's greatest rivers. However, agricultural productivity per acre is one of the lowest in the world. And yields are low because African Farmers depend heavily on rain-fed agriculture. They use less fertilizer. They plant poorer seed stock, and they employ outdated farming methods. But the administration, through its Feed the Future program, is committed to trying to generate a green revolution in Africa, similar to the green revolution that transformed agriculture in Asia and Latin America in the 1960s and 70s. Improving African agriculture will raise incomes, reduce household poverty, prevent food shortages and famine, and generate greater income for farmers. Energy. There is also a very strong commitment in Washington to help Africa address its energy needs. No continent and no country can develop without power. And Africa today is the most energy deficient continent in the world. More than two-thirds of Africans live without electrical power and nearly 85 percent of the rural population lacks access to electricity. Many of Africa's major cities suffer frequent power outages and lack adequate generating capacity. This means factories without power, schools without light, and hospitals without functioning medical equipment. President Obama's Power Africa initiative is intended to double 
power access in Africa over the next five years, working with the private sector in six key countries. The plan is intended to add more than 10,000 megawatts of power to the African grid, which should provide power to some 210 million African households, a much needed boost in energy for a continent short of it. And public health. Public health remains weak and uneven across Africa. The recent Ebola crisis in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone is a clear demonstration of this point. But while Ebola outbreaks remain relatively rare, HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and a variety of waterborne diseases continue to cripple and shorten the lives of Africans in many countries across the continent. President Obama's Global Health Initiative is intended to work with African governments to develop a comprehensive strategy to improve and integrate their health services. Building on the excellent work of President Bush's emergency plan to combat AIDS called PEPFAR, President Obama's Global Health Initiative will support AIDS prevention activities for 12 million people. Will also help to reduce malarial deaths and contribute to the cure of tuberculosis. This program will also have a special focus on improving health outcomes of women and girls and building up sustainability and capacity in local health authorities. With improved health, Africans can take advantage of the political and economic gains that are happening around them. Africa is not a static continent, and a great deal has been accomplished over the past 25 years. But challenges, large and small, remain, and we should expect that there will be setbacks as well as gains in individual countries and regions, but the trajectory remains positive, and it is in the interest of the United States to partner with states across Africa to advance objectives which are of mutual benefit and interest to Africa as well as the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Carson. Um, right now, we'd like to start the Q&A portion that we usually do. Um, you can come down to the mic over there or over here if you'd like to ask a question in person. Please keep them short. I know everybody likes to talk about how they have something in common with our speakers, and we love that, <laughs> but we're limited on time. Um, or you can text my phone here, and we'll take your text questions. But I'd like to start off. I had a couple come in already. Um, one question was, you described the AU the African Union, um, is this developed much like the European Union, and what are the similarities and differences between the two? Are they as organized as the EU, or um, are they getting there? I mean, uh, a, great, uh, a great question. They are not uh, as well organized uh, as the uh, European Union. Uh, the European Union is probably the most uh, sophisticated uh, uh, economic uh, uh, integration of uh, individual states, uh, regional states uh, in the world. Uh, the European Union uh, has uh, a common currency, 
uh, with the exception of Great Britain, which continues to use the British pound. Uh, it has a common set of uh, immigration policies which allow the citizens of one country to move across the border without uh, a, uh, a travel document. It allows for the free mobility of uh, labor, uh, and it has uh, virtually reduced completely uh, any tariffs uh, and uh, customs duties on goods. All of those things that I mentioned for the European Union do not, in effect, uh, exist uh, within the African Union. Uh, but uh, the African Union uh, is a political uh, organization uh, which uh, is trying uh, to promote greater political, sub-regional, uh, and economic uh, integration. Uh, it has a long time to go uh, before it gets to uh, the stage of the European uh, Union, uh, but one of the important steps that they have made over the last uh, 15 years is to uh, allow uh, the organization uh, to criticize uh, bad political leadership uh, in uh, other African countries, something that was not uh, done very much uh, uh, before the last decade. Okay, go ahead. Um, you mentioned Boko Haram a couple times, mm -hmm. and recently they just pledged allegiance to ISIS. Do you think that will change their involvement in Nigeria or American involvement towards Nigeria in Boko Haram? Uh, I do not uh, think so. I, I saw the uh, report uh, that uh, that Boko Haram had, in fact, pledged allegiance to, 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 to ISIS. Uh, one thing is uh, absolutely true, and that is uh, Boko Haram in northern, uh, northeastern, and I should have, oh, we don't have the map up there. Oh, that's good. Okay. In northeastern, uh, uh, northeastern uh, Nigeria has copied a lot of the tactics uh, employed by ISIS. Uh, they have uh, declared a caliphate uh, in the northeastern part of uh, Nigeria. Uh, they employ suicide uh, bombers, including young girls as young as 10 to 15 years of, of, of age. Uh, they've carried out uh, massacres uh, uh, as well. Uh, and they've become quite sophisticated in the use of the of messaging and communication, uh, putting their message out uh, to the public very quickly. Uh, you've heard about it, uh, and the ability uh, of them to get that message out uh, has been uh, more impressive uh, than the Nigerian government's ability uh, to get its message out or to be able to combat them. Uh, Boko Haram uh, is a very serious threat uh, to uh, uh, Nigeria, but it's also a very serious threat to Nigeria's neighbors, all of whom are weaker than Nigeria. Could you please speak to the activities of China in Africa? China, yeah. China um, is, has had a, uh, a long history uh, with uh, uh, Africa, uh, and that history has changed uh, over time. Let me uh, just go back uh, a moment uh, in time to say uh, when uh, China was uh, extremely politically active uh, uh, across the continent. Uh, some of you will remember uh, that uh, uh, up until uh, the uh, early uh, 1970s, that China was not only not a member of the Security Council, uh, but it was not, uh, in fact, um, uh, a full-fledged member of, of the UN. Uh, the Security Council seat was held by the government uh, in 
Taiwan in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s, uh, the government in Beijing worked very, very hard to convince, probably at the time, the second largest voting bloc in the UN, the African nations, to support of the uh, legitimacy of Beijing's claim to have that seat. People forget that China was not a Security Council member until the mid-1970s. But one of the reasons they were able to take that seat from Taiwan is with African votes. One of their strongest supporters in that effort, and I'm gonna, am I doing this right? It's not on, it's on now. There it is. One of China's strongest supporters was Tanzania in those days. And the, ta the Chinese rewarded, rewarded the Tanzanians by building one of the newest railroads uh, in Africa called the Tazara by some, the Tanzam by some, but the Tanzania Zambian Railroad was built by the Chinese almost as a thank you present for doing this. Then for probably two decades, China turned inwards and started to focus on its own set of economic challenges. And over the last three decades, we've seen China grow as a strong industrial power, a strong industrial power, growing at 9, 10, and 11 percent a year, highest in the world. And so to keep that growth alive, China had to turn someplace for energy, and they turned to Africa. I've talked about hydrocarbons in Angola, talked about hydrocarbons in Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea, Sudan, and places off the shore. China turned to Africa for oil. They turned to China, China turned to Africa for minerals to drive their power needs and their needs for minerals. And that was the key reason for them jumping into Africa. And they jumped in first in Sudan, where we had pulled out because of human rights violations here. American companies had done major explorations in South Sudan, Phillips Conoco and others. And when we barred trade and investment, the Chinese went in and took over those areas. But they have been involved in Africa for their economic reasons, their domestic economic reasons. They've needed oil, they needed gas, and they've needed minerals to drive their economy forward. And that's been a big, big factor. And they've also looked at it as a place where they could build businesses, where they could build railroads, where they could repair and build ports, where they could build new capital projects. So they've looked at it as, as a place where they could do business. But there's also been a political motive reintroduced as well. China does not like anybody meddling in their domestic affairs. Most African countries don't like that either. And so they've been able to find some friends on the continent because the Chinese, of course, don't want issues like uh, uh, the Uyghurs uh, uh, brought up. They don't want issues like the Dalai Lama brought up. And so if they've got African partners, 
they can keep these issues from coming up uh, in the Security Council, in the General Assembly, uh, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. So that's what they also are, are doing as well. A lot of people think of it as altruism for Africa. Chinese have their, their, their interests uh, as well. But we should not blame the Chinese for our indifference to the economic opportunities that we leave on the table. Because I think if you were to go and ask Africans, would they prefer to have a partner from the United States or Great Britain or Germany, they would probably say yes four times out of five. So we can't blame them. We have to also look and take advantage of these opportunities as well. I appreciate that you are pointing out all the positive things because you're right, we don't hear that and you said it very well. My questions have to do with the energy issues and agriculture again. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a lot about fossil fuels and yet there's so much sun in Africa <laughs> and we have friends in Chad and they power everything with solar panels. And about agriculture, you know, I hear a lot about the droughts and deforestation and um, I think the original Green Revolution wasn't successful there with putting a lot of pesticides and fertilizers on. And I understand that they're starting to do a lot more organic, sustainable mulching with stalks and, you know, becoming not needing all that stuff. Yeah, good question. I think that you're, you're absolutely right about energy needs. Uh, and I think that uh, what Africa needs to do uh, is to harness uh, the potential that exists with renewables. Everything does not have to be uh, driven uh, by gas uh, or electricity. And clearly, uh, countries uh, that have you know, 300 days of sunshine uh, a year should be doing uh, far more solar, and there should be solar farms. Uh, there uh, should be far more hydro, both large hydro uh, and uh, small uh, hydro uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, there are parts of Africa that are enormously windy, like parts of the southwest in the United States, and there should be more windmills uh, uh, employed uh, to generate uh, power. Uh, but uh, the reality is, too, is that gas is very inexpensive, uh, and gas should be uh, used to generate electricity and not flared off, as it is in many places in, in Africa. Uh, Nigeria flares a huge amount of its gas, uh, and uh, that uh, only creates uh, more uh, pollution. So. Clearly, all of these things uh, need, to, need to, to, to be done. And the energy needs uh, are quite uh, uh, amazing, quite amazing when you, when, you, when you look at them. We've talked uh, uh, about uh, Nigeria, uh, uh, for example. Uh, 180 uh, million people produces 2.2 uh, million barrels of gasoline. Uh, every uh, uh, every day, uh, it has uh, only uh, one oil refinery uh, that works uh, with any kind of regularity, uh, and uh, it generates uh, less. It generates less electricity as a country uh, than uh, your neighbor uh, in Chicago. So uh, that uh, indicates uh, the the need. On the, on the issue of, 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 of agriculture and how really central and important it is, uh, is, uh, is the fact that you know, you know, well over 70% you know, of, 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 of all of uh, Africans, primarily African households, primarily or secondarily depend on uh, agriculture as a, as a livelihood. 
Uh, and uh, one of the things that hasn't happened in talking about the Green Revolution is that uh, it, it's not only better farming techniques, uh, but uh, the science and the technology that has transformed agriculture here in the United States has also been responsible for transforming agriculture in, in, in Asia uh, and uh, in, in Latin America as well. Uh, our land-grant colleges have done a phenomenal job in the 60s and 70s uh, uh, in uh, helping countries uh, develop uh, seed, uh, appropriate uh, fer fertilizer, and different kinds of techniques uh, to uh, help to increase, uh, increase yields uh, without using heavy pesticides. So it, it can be done, and I think it's the use of that technology that has to be, uh, be uh, furthered as well. Another te text question. Uh, two parts. You talk about the growing middle class, but mm -hmm. can you describe what the middle class looks like in Africa in respect to the United States middle class? Are you talking the same thing, apples to apples, or does it look different? And then why do you think the U.S. is not seizing on the economic opportunity and potential in Africa? Two good questions. Uh, the middle class would be, uh, in Africa, uh, described probably in technical terms. Uh, how many uh, people are earning uh, money uh, on a per capita basis above uh, a, a certain amount a day. Uh, and yes, there is a growing uh, middle class uh, across, uh, across, across Africa. Um, uh, if you uh, go into uh, African countries uh, like Kenya, uh, like Ghana, uh, even uh, Nigeria, if you go uh, into uh, to Nigeria, uh, you will find uh, that uh, people are uh, better educated, uh, they are professionals, uh, they're accountants, uh, they're doctors, uh, they're engineers, uh, they're, they're, they're lawyers, uh, they're, business, uh, they're di business people. Um, just think... Uh, if you uh, lived in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, the commercial capital uh, of this country of 180 million people, uh, and uh, you ran one of the transportation companies moving people in and out of the city to their jobs, you would be a transportation mogul. Uh, think if you were uh, running a series of grocery stores, or baking bread, or making boxes, putting uh, milk, selling milk, or eggs, you would be making huge amounts of, 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 of money uh, doing uh, legitimate things. This is what's generating uh, the, that, that middle class. Uh, but it's not a middle class that's, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's making 30 or 40,000 dollars a year because the uh, cost of living is, is much lower, uh, but it is based uh, on uh, the ability of people uh, to earn uh, a uh, level of income that moves them out of uh, poverty uh, and subsistence. Uh, but uh, there has been an enormous growth in education around, uh, around Africa uh, over the last 50 years, and, we can, uh, and that is, uh, that's seen. Uh, but the professionalization uh, has come along with uh, along with uh, with urbanization uh, as well. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your distinguished service to our country, including in some challenging environments. Uh, <laughs> Thank your, you. Your presentation has been very comprehensive. But I wonder if you would address U.S. military and security cooperation with Africa, particularly the role of AFRICOM, the Africa Command? Yeah. Uh, good, good, good question. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy uh, around the creation of, of, uh, of the Africa Command. Uh, why it was done now, I, I think about seven years ago, uh, it's been you know, three, six, uh, 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 you know, it's about seven, eight years ago that the Africa Command was, was created. Africa Command uh, uh, was uh, an effort to give 
to uh, Africa uh, uh, give the kind of Defense Department attention to Africa that other parts of the world had received. Uh, if you're familiar with what we call our commands or our combatant commands, you will know that every uh, region of the world has what is called a combatant uh, commander. Uh, some of the ones you know and are familiar with. Uh, NATO, uh, uh, Sink Ewer, uh, the job that uh, people like uh, Colin Powell and others have had. He was a combatant commander for all forces throughout uh, Europe. But we've also uh, had a combatant uh, command uh, for, uh, for, for Asia, uh, based uh, in, uh, in, in Honolulu, uh, 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 the Sink Pack commander, commander in Pacific, commander of the Pacific uh, in Asia. Uh, we've always had a, a combatant commander uh, for Latin uh, America. Uh, used to be based uh, in Panama, uh, now based uh, in uh, MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa. So we had a combatant commander for Asia based in Hawaii, combatant commander for, uh, for Europe uh, uh, based in Brussels, combatant commander for Latin America based uh, in, uh, in Florida. And yes, the famous combatant commanders these days are the ones uh, for uh, what we do uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, uh, Central Command, as it's called. Uh, and they, too, are based in Florida, although they've got an advanced base out in, uh, uh, out in, uh, out in Kuwait. But we never, had, we never had an Africa command. Africa was split up between... Uh, at least three different commands. I don't know whether I've done this, uh, but that's all right. I'll push again somewhere. The Indian Ocean and the area from Kenya and Somalia and Ethiopia, this area and Madagascar, all uh, belong uh, to uh, the Pacific Command out in Hawaii. They were responsible for this. Egypt and these guys were a part of Central Command, and the rest of Africa was a part of European Command. And so uh, it was decided that to generate greater efficiencies, uh, that uh, they would create a Central Command for Africa to match up with the other regional commands. And, and that was the, the origin of, of, of the idea create an Africa command that matched up with the other global commands uh, that we had around uh, the world. And that this command, of course, then would take responsibility for all of the activities uh, that went on there. Uh, almost everywhere uh, that we are in Africa today, uh, we've got military attaches. Those military attaches are now under the command of Africa Command. Uh, we've long uh, had in many places around the continent military assistance missions, groups that were there to train and assist and, uh, and help to uh, make African armies more professional. They also came under the rubric of, of, of Africa Command. Uh, and uh, the creation of this command uh, has made a lot of people extraordinarily nervous uh, because uh, they have looked at it as the militarization of America's policies uh, in Africa. And there uh, is uh, no doubt that everyone uh, is aware that we do <coughs> have in Africa uh, a, uh, a couple of uh, facilities uh, that are uh, increasingly well known. Uh, we have uh, a, a facility here in this red area uh, called uh, Djibouti, uh, where uh, we keep uh, some two or 3,000 uh, Marines uh, operate out of there. Uh, we operate alongside the French, the 
the French have long had a facility there uh, where they operate from. Uh, we are co-located with them uh, there. And we also uh, have uh, facilities in the uh, in the northern part, so in the northern part of uh, of, of of Kenya, up here uh, as well, uh, near a place called uh, Lamu, uh, where there are a small number of, uh, of 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 U.S. sailors and and special forces there. Uh, there, uh, we've been uh, o alongside the British, who have uh, traditionally always done their uh, their uh, their, uh, their warm weather training uh, in, uh, in northern Kenya have done that since the uh, end of the Second World War. Controversial uh, in some regards because lots of unexploded ordnance over the years has killed a lot of Kenyans, and, <coughs> and they've been brought to court in London over these issues. But those are the only two places where we have really uh, any kind of uh, substantial presence on the on the on the ground in uh, in Africa, um, we're not the only ones. As I say, the French have uh, facilities uh, in various places: Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Senegal, uh, where they have had uh, facilities for for many many years. Okay, last question. Last quick question, I guess. In your four decades of exemplary service as a foreign service officer, much of it in Africa, most of it in Africa, it seems, what do you regard as your most satisfying or proudest mo experience, and how about your most challenging or difficult experience? <laughs> uh, I've had a lot of uh, a, a lot of a lot of challenges and a lot of good things uh, as as well. Um, the the most rewarding aspect of working in Africa uh, has been the universal uh, friendship uh, of uh, Africans uh, with whom I have had an opportunity to meet and work with. Uh, around the continent, uh, and I have found uh, the openness, the the, the friendship, uh, the hospitality uh, across uh, many many uh, countries, uh, probably uh, as rewarding and as welcoming as uh, anyone could could ever want. So I think it's uh, it's the friendship and the and the and the hospitality. Uh, there have been uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, of of challenges uh, that continue to uh, exist uh, uh, out there. Uh, I am a, a, a very, very strong advocate and supporter of, uh, of, of strengthening uh, democratic institutions. Uh, they really do uh, add value and protect people. Uh, and so uh, every time I see a democratic reversal in Africa, I am saddened by it, uh, but I still see far more progress in that area than I see backsliding. Thank you, Ambassador <laughs> Carson, for a very balanced and most comprehensive presentation on Africa. I am sure you all feel the same way I do. We have learned a great deal about the promising trends of political and economic development in African region, um, much more than what we have uh, heard uh, and reported by the media. And uh, despite all the tremendous challenges, we look forward to seeing a more and more meaningful global partnership uh, to help and support the world's last frontier to continue its positive trajectory toward an advanced and democratic Africa. So please join me in another round of applause for Ambassador Carson. <laughs> Next week, former U.S. Ambassador to Brazil Melvin Levinsky 
will join us to discuss Brazil's metamorphosis. Please join us for another interesting discussion on March 16th. So our meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much for coming. Good night.